Good morning, aloha. And we are delighted to welcome you here today to our Tokyo International Gift uh, Show Seminar. I'm Brenda Foster. I'm the chair of the Hawaii Pacific Export Council. And on behalf of our partners at DBED, the Small Business Administration, and SBDC, we are thrilled that you have been able to come to participate in these programs uh, that we've been conducting throughout the year. I would like to remind everyone, including welcome to our people who are streaming this program online, uh, that your comments are being filmed and that anybody who speaks, since we are filming all the videos for the seminars, uh, that if you make a comment or anything, that everybody, one, will be able to hear it, but two, whether it's DBED or HPEC, and we put uh, the videos of the seminars online, uh, that your comments will be there also. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Jamie Lum from DBED to talk a little bit about the programs and the steps that we've been going through uh, this year. Jamie. Aloha and good morning. Thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, this seminar this morning is part of our Hawaii State Trade Expansion Program, otherwise known as High Step. Uh, it, it's a program that we receive federal funding from, from the Small Business Administration. It's actually part of a national initiative to increase U.S. exports uh, called the State Trade Expansion Program or the STEP program. So um, we are the administrators of the grant for the state of Hawaii, and we work with various partners like HPEC, like the Small Business Development Center, like the Foreign Trade Zone, um, and a number of other organizations to carry out the program. Uh, there are three components, and uh, those of you that have been here before, you've heard the, the spiel. Many of you have participated in the past years, but we do have three components to our program. Uh, one is our export readiness training program, of which this seminar is a part of. Uh, another, another component is uh, our, our Hawaii pavilions, of which the Tokyo International Gift Show is a part of. And then the last component is our uh, financial assistance program. So uh, with the export readiness training program, we have partnered with HPEC to put on a series of seminars uh, intended for companies who are either new to export or who have been exporting but are looking to increase their exports. Um, we offer a number of different topics ranging from different um, um, export related topics like logistics or uh, ramping up your production for exporting to a market specific type of programs like we did one on Canada, we've done one on Japan, and so forth. So all of this is intended for you as your company, as you're looking at what your export strategy will be to um, gain all, uh, more knowledge and, and input all of that into an export development plan. And then with that export development plan, you can move into other aspects of the program, such as the um, participating in one of the Hawaii pavilions. These are shows that uh, we have designated um, as shows that we think would be uh, fitting for Hawaii companies and we go in and we purchase space uh, like the Tokyo Gift Show and we go in under the brand of Hawaii. We recruit companies and we have companies come um, and all of you work individually to help um, find customers and distributors and buyers for your products but all under the umbrella of Hawaii. So that's our second aspect, the Hawaii Pavilion. So the last aspect is our financial assistance program. For this year we have given out um, all of the funding, but we do put funds aside for um, companies. It's, it's given out on a competitive basis, and um, basically you present your export plan to us, and, and you can get some funds to help implement various aspects of your export plan. So that's kind of the high step uh, program in a nutshell. We are coming to, uh, towards the end of this grant cycle, which, is, which ends in September and uh, we are awaiting word from the SBA to see if we get another grant for 2018. Um, but all of this information is on our website, invest.hawaii.gov, under the exporting tab. So you can just go there if you need more information. Um, please, I, I invite you to, to visit that. And um, with that, I just thank you again for coming this morning. Hello. Perfect timing. Jamie, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate uh, the support that DBED, SPDC, the Small Business Administration have given to this program. I see that uh, we have another special guest who would like to make a few comments. Uh, the director of DBED, uh, Luis Oliveira, is here. Luis, may I ask you to come up and address both the audience in the room and our online audience? 
to make it. We have a very uh, large online audience because we stream each of our seminars to increase the participation and the reach. So please, aloha. Uh, I really have no prepared remarks other than the fact that having been a part of the Tokyo International Gift Show uh, for the last two years, I got to say that it is probably one of my most proudest and most enjoyable uh, initiatives that the department actually goes through. I get to see and work with each and every one of you individually to see you guys in action while we're all in Tokyo at the largest international gift show uh, trade exposition that uh, that exists in Asia and it is absolutely a wonderful wonderful thing to see and all a lot of credit goes to our to our partners uh, with SBA and as well as with the business support and development branch under Dennis too as well and Marlene and Lyle and everybody and I see Tim over there you know these are the people that are really trying to to move Hawaii's economy going forward and with the things that you guys do so again it, no applause to me the applause really is to you guys so I just want to thank you guys for all being here and if there's anything that that I can do personally for each and every one of you please don't ever hesitate to ask so thank you very much and appreciate the opportunity to be here thank you very much now with that I'd like to introduce Dennis Ling who is the administrator for business development at DBED who will also introduce and moderate our panel discussion that we'll have today Dennis Aloha everyone, my name is Dennis Ling. I'm with the uh, Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. And it's heartening to see so many faces here uh, for this one of our most major initiatives at DBED, which is the uh, Tokyo International Gift Show. As Jamie had mentioned, the, uh, we have an application into the SBA for the continued support for the Hawaii State Trade Export Program. So we need all of your good vibrations transferred over to Washington, D.C. so that they can approve another round of grants for us so we can continue to do what we're doing uh, in addition to the financial assistance program, the training, but also the trade shows that we do. The uh, Tokyo International Gift Show, as I uh, had mentioned, is one of our major initiatives. And it's, uh, as Lewis had mentioned, the uh, largest trade show, gift trade show in Asia. It attracts about 200,000 buyers, wholesalers, licensors, distributors, uh, and also people who are interested in finding new products for export into the Asian market. So it's a very big show. It's a held at the big site, which is a big pavilion over in Tokyo. And it covers, I, I can't even explain, it's something like four football fields, if you will, maybe even more than that. But there's, a, I would think there's something like 15,000 exhibitors, and we're just a part of it with a pavilion, though. We have a huge pavilion. And uh, we do attract, if we have 200,000 people attending that show, even if we attract 10% 10, uh, 10 of that, that's a good 20,000 people that we see through the show, which is quite a large amount of people. So if you can imagine that. But to give you a better idea as to what I'm talking about, we do have a slideshow for you. Actually, pictures of our pavilion, it will give you some idea as to what I'm talking about. So Blake, if you will, let's uh, uh, show some of the photos. Oh, that's not, oh, okay. This is the opening ceremonies. As in Japan, they do things very ceremoniously. And uh, uh, in the middle there, prominently featured is our director, Lewis, and uh, Representative Ken Ito there. Uh, but they all have these nice big fat ribbons with the uh, huge uh, red carnation. And uh, uh, the media is there, so they do have media coverage and everything. This is our pavilion. And uh, the way we've designed this is to go upwards so we can show the people who are walking around that were there. And uh, it has a Hawaii theme on it. We didn't want to do anything in the boots. If you see, the boots are left kind of empty for you to put in your own display. 
so that there's more room for your own products and uh, posters. We went upwards to show that it is the Hawaii Pavilion. On the sides, you see the signs that say Hawaii. It says made in Hawaii, so they know it is the authentic Hawaii product rather than the Hawaii-like products that are coming from other places. Blake? This is another vantage point of the pavilion. This is, that was just one side. There's another section, the same pavilion on the other side. So uh, it's uh, like two rows of this. This is our farmer's market. They're doing sampling and uh, some uh, demonstrations there. Here's our grocery store, our farmer's market grocery store area where we have food for sale, products for sale. This is uh, one of our vendors and her display. And that's Jimmy Chan who will be part of our panel uh, later on who will be uh, providing some insight into his experience. It's another grocery store picture. And that's Aaron Lau who uh, will also be joining us if not in person but remotely. He's with uh, Lau Lau uh, Woodworks or Simply Woods. That's a chocolate company, Manoa Chocolate Company. They uh, were quite popular because they had samples to pass out. <laughs> and Sparky Doo's uh, Wings Hawaii. And uh, another vendor. Oh, this is the first lady, the uh, governor's wife, Don Amano Ige. Last year she came and she visited each booth uh, and she was blown away by the, uh, well, our representation there, first of all, but blown away with the size of the show and the people who were going through our boots and uh, being part of the whole uh, 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 event. So she checked out and spoke to each of the people uh, who were there and checked their products. And she had uh, two huge bags of samples to take home, which... Uh, we had to lug back for her. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's Anthony. That's uh, from Maui, the Maui delegation. They had a booth for made in Maui products. And that's Satomi Gu, who's here. She's with Hawaii Teas. I mean, Hawaii Tea Chest. <laughs> And I guess we're back at the beginning with uh, Lois again. So if anybody would like pictures of themselves, we can make them available to you, no charge, uh, if you were featured in that. <laughs> but that's what the Tokyo International Gift Show looks like. So I think we'll go into our panel discussion now. So I could call up uh, our panelists, uh, Cheryl, Jimmy, is Neil here? Uh, he's running a little late. Um, he's stuck on the, uh, on the production line. You know? Oh, OK. He'll be running in smelling like chocolate, hopefully with free samples for everyone. Oh, uh, OK. Uh, that's good. Well, thank you, Cheryl and Jimmy, for doing this. You know, I could call up some others who were at the, uh, the show. So, Tommy, would you like to join us? Of course. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> so, Tommy. Huh? Oh, hi, Aaron. And, and there are samples that, you I, that I ran in late, so go ahead. Sure. Yeah, come. I, I think the more people we can give to give their impression and, uh, you know, help discuss things. Sparky, would you like to join us too? Oh, Sparky is, Sparky is shy. <laughs> Those of you who know Sparky, uh, he really isn't. Oh, okay. Hi, Aaron. Hello. Aloha. Hi. And then that's Aaron Lau with Lau Lau Woodworks uh, Simply Woods. And to my right is Cheryl Sora with Tori Richard. Cheryl has been with us for all five years of the uh, Tokyo International Gift Show. Yeah, I forgot to mention, this is our fifth time. So uh, we will be going on our fifth uh, show. We participated four times before this. 
Next to her is Jimmy Chan of Hawaii Chip Company. Uh, and to his right is Satomi Gu from uh, Hawaii Tea Chess, or Tea Chess Hawaii. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, as I said, it's uh, five years running. When we first started, we only had 38 exhibitors. Now we're pushing 70. So we've grown quite a bit. Uh, when we first started, Neil's not here, but uh, if those of you who remember the first year, we had such a, a rinky-dink uh, pavilion that we had to decide that, hey, if we're going to do this, we got to step up our game and do something really good. So we did that pavilion, and uh, you know, it showcases Hawaii. It uh, adds a lot to uh, what our products. You know, our products are very important. Uh, it, it's the brand of Hawaii, and it says a lot about Hawaii. So we wanted to make sure our pavilion does service to the products that you folks have. So we developed uh, the, uh, the pavilion to match this. Uh, this is Neil Arakaki from uh, Menehune Mac, uh, our go-to guy uh, who's our, our on-the-ground person in Japan. And I was telling them, Neil, about how when we first started four years ago, or five years ago, Six years ago. Six years, six years ago. <laughs> oh, this is going to be our sixth time? Oh, sixth time. Hey, staff, yeah, this sixth is my time. Fifth, I did the sixth. <laughs> seventh so, this is our seventh time. Really? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's been a long it, it, Time flies when you're having fun. Anyway, uh, we decided to uh, upgrade our pavilion to match uh, your product, and uh, we want to make sure that your brand is well spoken of. Uh, throughout the years, we've generated over 20 million in export sales, and uh, we've uh, our metrics of n new new companies to the market, or new to export companies, and also the increase in the dollar of export sales has also increased dramatically. So much thanks to all of you for participating. Those of you who are thinking about it next year, please let us know soon enough. So if we have to expand the pavilion, we can do so. Because once we decide on the size, the footprint of our pavilion, that's it. We can't grow any further. But with uh, your input, we can determine how much larger we can go if we can. So with that, I'd like to toss it over to our panel. Uh, first of all, there's many reasons to participate in this trade show. As I mentioned to you, the number of buyers and wholesalers and agents and licensors uh, you know, that are, uh, are present there. Uh, but I wanted to ask, uh, you know, for our panelists, Cheryl, why do you participate in our trade show? Uh, basically, so we can get our name out in Japan. Um, there is brand recognition, but to actually be there um, at the show and to represent the brand and uh, basically show people that, hey, um, we're not just in Hawaii or just in America, but we're also in Japan too, and we're here to expand basically in the Japan market. So, yeah. Jimmy? I want to get rich. <laughs> <laughs> but through participation, I learned that there's uh, the potential, uh, but you got to put in the time. And uh, a lot of that was from conversations, conversations with Neil. And, you know, um, you can be a flash in the pan and sell eight containers, and maybe they'll never, you'll never hear from them again. Or you take your time and build, build your business over time. And that's, that's the process I'm going through right now. And I am trying to grow my sales in Japan. Because in Hawaii, we've got a population of maybe one million people. Tokyo alone, that's 10 times the amount of people, 12 times during the daytime. So there's a tremendous potential for sales. So I'm just trying to work my way towards that. So don't we? Same as Jimmy, we want to get rich. Um, but <laughs> Holding our breaths. You know, after we're like in our 22nd year in business and we wanted to expand, um, we realized that we're a big portion of our sales is a gift market and our teas our flavored teas are well received by the Japanese and so um, we thought you know let's try Japan and um, 
what we what we've done is as much as you know we want to expand but we wanted to make sure that when we get there we wanted to do it where it's effective so our quest was we had to look for a distributor and um, the first show that we did with uh, with um, you know with the uh, DBED is um, we our distributor was at the show so it worked well for us but you know, like Jimmy says, it takes a lot of work. I mean, it's not like you just do one show and then you stop. You know, um, it's it's sort of an ongoing thing, mm -hmm. and we're learning. You know, we've just learned that, well, not just, but um, that Hawaii products are known as summer products. So um, how do we get beyond that? Um, we're still working on it, um, but it's been a very very good show. Thank you. Um, um, it's an excellent show. Aaron, I'll toss it to you now. Why do I keep doing it? Because yeah, I'm Chinese like Jimmy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're speaking to about 50% no. of the room. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't even know how many people are there. Uh, but, um, so, like Jimmy and everybody says, uh, I wouldn't expect for your first time to expect everything to go gangbusters. Otherwise, you're going to be really grouchy the whole show <laughs> if, you, if you don't get your big account. But um, when you do business with the Japanese, it takes a long time. I mean, this is going to be my fifth year. And uh, only now I'm starting to get more distribution. But um, I have set up accounts on my own, my product is a little different from food products. So I have set up accounts on my own through the show, but I don't have massive distribution, which I want to get rich like Jimmy. So, Not there yet. Not there yet. <laughs> but it's going to take a lot of work. And the Japanese, it's, it's just like Hawaii. I mean, you got to develop the relationship in order to do a lot of business with them. Uh, so the more, to me, the more the Hawaii has a presence in that gift show every year, the more people will find out about it and the more people will come. So I don't think it's something that Hawaii should stop doing or DBED should stop doing because it's a regular thing that the Japanese need to see. So that's why I keep doing it. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Uh, for your information, there's about 250 people here in the room. <laughs> wow, it has much bigger than that conference room that you had before. Yeah, we have, we have standing room only. <laughs> You know, to, to, to actually just build on Aaron's point a little bit about, um, you know, even though it takes time and all that, but, you know, part of the participation comes with being able to participate with other quality companies in Hawaii under the same, um, you know, in a cohesive presentation. Um, you saw how beautiful that um, booth was. Um, that's not something that I would be able to afford on my own, you know, that display. Um, so getting the support from DBED and you know, uh, all, 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 the, all these entities are, it's, it's tremendous help for us as small businesses with limited budgets to be able to present ourselves, um, you know, to stand up to the rest of the um, products that you're going to be up against in that show. I, so, yeah, and I also yeah. want to add to what Aaron was saying. Um, he said that this is his, I'm sorry, Aaron, was it your fifth time? going to yeah, Japan. Yeah, I think Dennis is wrong. This is my fifth time. Okay. And <laughs> <laughs> and um, he's saying that, you know, he's just starting to build business. In Japan, they like to see that you're there and you're going to be there for the long run. Um, if you do just one show and then that's it, you're probably not going to be able to build the business. Everybody here, we've been going for the last at least a few years and that's how we're starting to build the business. They want to see that you're there and you're always going to be there and that you're in it for the long run and, you know, that they can count on you basically to be there um, to help them out, you know, and be able to sell them and not just uh, go to one show and then that's it and they never hear from you again. So if this is something you decide to do, uh, think of it as a long-term kind of thing and not just a one-shot deal. You know? Neil, yeah, there's a lot of bureaucracy in Japan. Yeah. <laughs> so it takes a while. Uh, Neil, Neil is actually our uh, sensei for the uh, Japan market. He knows a lot about the Japan market through his own company, mm -hmm. but also in dealing with others. So, Neil? Okay, well, um, my, my company is Menuhune Mac Chocolates. Uh, so we've been exporting to Japan 
close on 40 years now. Uh, we're one of the original guys way back in the day. And the market has changed incredibly from those days to now. Mm -hmm. My advantage has been I've been able to see it from day one and kind of stay in the market all these years. Um, Learn how to do what we did because we made every possible mistake in the book. <laughs> and you just don't do it a second time. Okay? And so we went through the school of hard knocks, and I don't want anybody to repeat the kind of disasters we ran into. And a lot of them weren't our fault. It's understanding the market. But uh, I'm also the contractor for, for the Hawaii Pavilion, mm -hmm. for, for the Tokyo Gift Show. A couple of things real quick. The, the DBIT puts up the most incredible trade show pavilion ever. Okay, I mean, I've been doing sh uh, shows with the state since the 80s. There's never been a Hawaii pavilion like this before. There's never been a presentation like this before. Okay, it gains attention. Um, you're gonna get your share of buyers coming and take a look at you just because you're in the Hawaii section, okay? Second thing is just building on what they were saying. The Japan market is an investment. It's not a one, to, it's not the made in Hawaii show, okay? Um, I work with the, f the new companies every year who come in and one of the, the first things I've got to dispel is, this is not like doing a trade show here. It's not like doing a trade show on the mainland. It's a different animal. But it's a very, very, very lucrative market. You just need the patience and the time to develop your presence and your strategy, okay? Um, if anybody, rule of thumb, you do the trade show, I expect to see you for three years. Okay? You won't know if you have a market unless you do the show for three years. The buyers may love your product, but they won't approach you the first year because they're not sure if you're gonna be there next year. And that's been a big bugaboo for a lot of first-time companies. Well, nobody really came to see me. I got a few cards, but nobody really followed up. It's because they like your product, they're just not sure if you're there for the long haul. The Japanese are very conservative buyers and they're very particular buyers. If they see you the second year, they're going like, hey, he's still here, and they do remember you. Um, G Jimmy's real modest. Jimmy, Jimmy is actually my poster child. Um, <laughs> he did the, He was in the Japan circuit for trade shows for three years. First two years, I'm talking about n nothing, just nothing, but he just kept hitting it. In the third year, uh, his sales went from zero to 60 in a matter of three months because his brand recognition was there, people understood the product, um, and uh, it kind of took of a, he's the Hawaiian chip company, but he's not selling taro chips in Japan, he's selling Kilauea barbecue fire sauce. And it's, uh, it's all over the place. Um, it's, it's gaining popularity in regular restaurants. It's not a Hawaiian product, per se. Okay? There's a lot of that. Um, I'd, like to, yeah. I'd like to add on that if I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I go to a lot of trade shows in the US, mainland, and I do their wholesale trade shows much like this one. And doing business in the US is far different from doing business in Japan. Yeah, but when, it's harder to do business in Japan, but once you get that zero to 60 that Jimmy got and some other people got, uh, once you become a trend, I mean, it's nonstop. And that's what we all hope for. So it yeah. just takes time. And the more you're in front of these people, mm -hmm. the more they'll, they'll Try and bring them omiyage too once you come and visit them every year. You know. Yes. Yeah. Well, we'll go into. Bring the... bring Menahuni Mac. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or some of our other uh, vendors' products. Uh, by the way, Jimmy Chan is the uh, SBA Exporter of the Year for the uh, Hawaii District. So. Yay. You know, wanted to recognize that. Uh, you know, he was nominated by us. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Okay. laughs> you know, the, uh, being an exhibitor at the trade show is one thing, but you're also there to be an observer. Uh, mm -hmm. You'll learn a lot by just attending the show, even if you make no sale. Uh, however, as they said, you know, you have to expose yourself to it. So what are some of the other things that, uh, you know, the panelists can recommend about participating in the trade show as an observer uh, to sort of, you would learn about your competition for perhaps, uh, uh, packaging would be another one, but Cheryl, why don't well, you? I learned from everybody at the show. I, think, I learned yeah. from everybody at the show. Oh, that's great. And that's why, I, yeah. that's why it's really great doing this show because we get to know everybody and everybody gives you helpful tips. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a really great show. 
Thank you, Aaron. Cheryl? I think it's also good to walk around the show if you have a chance. I know a lot of times you're the only one at the booth and you can't run away, but if you ever have the chance, even walk around for half an hour, an hour, I say definitely get out, go look at everything that's out there, see what they're doing. Um, Japan is all about packaging, see how they package everything, see how they sell things. Um, you know, walking around the show uh, is a uh, it's great because you get all these ideas and you see what other people in Japan are doing as well. So you kind of get an idea of what kind of markets out there and what people are buying. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, <clears throat> yeah. I, you know, definitely, definitely study, study what the other companies yeah. are presenting to you. And, um, uh, you know, again, 200,000 people in a single show, that is a tremendous opportunity to get feedback on your own products and just see, hey, do I have a marketable product? And, um, you know, and sometimes you, you pivot. I mean, you know, I, Neil, I, I first went to Japan with Neil, um, what was it? Oh, geez, almost eight years ago. <laughs> and, uh, and first thing he did, because we're in the food industry, took us to the supermarkets in Japan. And, you know, this is where, where you go buy your daily groceries. And I'm like, oh, my God, the fruit is perfect. How, <laughs> how, how and, and the packaging and all this. And how are my chips going to stand up? to the packaging. Mm -hmm. am, am I really going to have a chance at competing? And that's where after a few years of commitment and gauging reactions from shows and you know, I pivoted to the sauce because I saw that as a product that I could actually compete with. And um, you know, that's, that's part of my, um, part, of, part of what I gained out of that. And also it's not just what I'm exporting to Japan. It's about what I'm seeing in Japan that's making my business better here. So, you know, sure, my export sales took three years to grow, and now we're really, you know, we're really hitting a point where it looks like it's, it's the real deal. Um, but in the meantime, my business here in Hawaii has more than doubled by what I've applied from seeing in Japan, so. That's good, I mean, um you know, for from our experience, it's you know, it's the same. It's you know what you're saying. Um, we sell tea. Uh, we sell flavored tea. I mean, that's our forte. We try to make tea that are um, flavors that we grew up with, right? So, we in Hawaii, we know what Hayden mango tastes like, right? Not Mexican mango and so forth. So that's what we wanted to bring to our teas. Now, tea is uh, Hawaii, Japan grows tea. So it makes it a little bit more, um, not difficult, but a little different for us. So when we're at the show, um, what we do, we walk the show, we see what the trends are, we see what the Japanese themselves are making, what kind of teas, what kind of flavored teas, and um, you know, we compare with ours, and then we go out into the market, um, all the department stores, how does it work, how do these companies get their teas here, you know, uh, it's very obvious that, you know, it's packaging, but it's more than packaging, it's, it's what makes our tea unique. So those are the things that we, you know, we're studying, and we're still studying. Um, you know, we're, we're not big like Jimmy yet in Japan. <laughs> we're, start, we're still trying to brand our product in Japan. We're pretty much, I think we're pretty well branded here in Hawaii. So, like Jimmy, he went into his sauces um, because he's not going to ship potato chips, right? Yep. I mean, you might as well make it there. For us, what can we do? Um, and there's a, there's a term OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer. In America, it's called private label. So, we want to still brand, but at the same time, how do we make money in Japan or how do we get more known with other distributors? And that is through private labeling. So that's another avenue that we've discovered that's possible in Japan. Um, but I really encourage you as an observer, look at all those opportunities, look at your product and see what can I do differently, what are they doing, what do the Japanese like, and sometimes for me as Japanese I still don't know what they like. You know, and they're a very trendy kind of a group. So my fear, well it shouldn't really be a fear, it's so a flavor is taking off. How long is that flavor going to last in Japan? Five years, ten years? I don't know. But those are the things that we, um, as you know, as manufacturers, got to look at. 
Yeah. Um, yeah, going to the Japan, uh, going to Japan for trade shows and especially the Tokyo gift show, it's um, it's an investment. You're paying for airfare. You're paying for you know, of course, get high step. It really helps. Okay, but I yep. I tend to see newer companies focus on the show and not focus on the education. Yeah. Okay. Um, and you you've already plopped down all this money to be there, and all you're doing is standing in a three by three booth. 90% of the time, and you're just oblivious to what's going on in the market. Okay, you've got it's it's like you've got a plan. I'm doing the show, but I also want to see this, and I want to, it's, you've got to make this agenda to see where things are. Um, uh, hopefully, if I become the contractor again, well, every year what I try to do is help every individual company with individual questions. Where can I find products, my category of products, to see what it looks like on the market? It may not be at the show, but well, why don't you go to this store? Or why don't you go to that section of town and look around and see? Um, it, it's a lot of his logistics. I'll even help you with. Um, I got a lot of guys with hotels. Going, I want to get a hotel that's really, really, really cool. They're an hour and a half away from the show site, <laughs> and they're never going to see anything in town because they're too busy sitting on the train going back and forth after the show. Those are the kind of things you, you plan. This is an this is an all-encompassing event. In other words, it's this part of it's the trade show, part of it's your education. First year guys out there, I strongly recommend education. It's going to make your trip worthwhile. Okay? It's going to improve your presentation. It's going to improve your products for the second year you do the show. Okay? And as Jimmy said, a lot of times it's evaluating your product. Very, very rarely does your Hawaii product fit into the Japanese mode of product. Okay? American sizes are usually too big or, or, or something. In Japanese, like this little cute little packaging. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to observe this. Not everybody can make the shift overnight, but you've got to be cognizant of the fact that your product might be great, but if the package is this big, no one's going to buy it. And it's, it's that kind of thing. You see that by observing. Nobody can tell you how to sell your product. You guys are the experts on your own product. Okay. But getting to know why and how the Japanese buy things is how you progress in the market. Besides, don't get stuck in the bars like we do. <laughs> I'm just of, following that, Neil. <laughs> as, as the panelists mentioned, it is an investment. I mean, you are putting down quite a bit of uh, money to get there as well as your time. Uh, so you need to be prepared. You need to go there with the mindset that you are there to do business. So preparing for the trade show uh, is very important. And uh, Neil, you want to tell about some of the things that you definitely should be prepared to do, uh, some of the materials you need to have, some of the uh, research you should have done, uh, anything else that gets you in the mode to be successful at this trade show. Okay, th I mean, there's a full laundry list, and I won't go into all of it here, okay? Number one mistake that I've seen people actually do is prepare for the trade show and then find out that their passports are invalid. Japan has a new rule, you need six months validity in your passport or they won't let you enter the country. And that's a new, that's a new law. I've already gotten five guys in my group who had to renew for this year's show. They didn't know the passport. Okay. So just getting there, be sure you can get there. Okay. Logistics, where's your hotel, what you're going to do. I, I want to get you physically situated comfortably so you're not stressing out, uh, just trying to get to and from the show and am I going to get lost. Okay. Um, at the sh uh, to prepare for the show, uh, a lot of guys ask me, do I need Japanese materials? Point of, point of sales materials, printed materials. Not necessary, but very, very useful. Okay, and I'll, I'll tell you why. In Hawaii, we find people to translate our materials into Japanese. What we don't realize is that it's just like in English. There's people who can write text for advertising and people who can't. A literal translation of your product is very, very dry. Okay, and it's very uninteresting. Um, their buyers are like our buyers. They want something that's a little sexy. They want something that's interesting to read. And a lot of the times in Hawaii, we don't have that level, or we can't find the person who can actually do that type of translation. So it, there's a little thought to this. It's just that like, here's my material. Can you translate to Japanese for me? That is kind of a half step back. But it's better to have something in Japanese. Okay. Um, a lot of, another question I get a lot of time is, should I have Japanese printed business cards? Um, yes, it helps. But the Japanese can read a lot of English. A lot more English than you would ever suspect. Okay, um, I wouldn't say go out and print Japanese cards just for the show. I mean, some people do. Uh, it's okay. It's not absolutely necessary. 
is absolutely necessary. Okay? Um, understand what products you're going to take up. Uh, first year, it's hard. Okay? A lot of people have multiple product lines. Not everything will work. Uh, Pre-qualifying your products, what you want to show the Japanese, and how to effectively to display them in your booth area takes planning. Okay. I have a lot of first-time companies, especially the smaller guys who think it's the Made in Hawaii show, they just come with their boxes and they look at the show and they just make it up as they go along. And it looks like they, make, they made it up like they went along. Okay. And the Japanese appreciate a good presentation. The Japanese appreciate nice, clean presentations. Um, we can go over those kind of details uh, later on uh, if, you, when you guys, if and when you guys come to the shows uh, pre-show. Um, it's not necessary to speak Japanese, but it helps a lot. Uh, DBIT provides group translators. Uh, they bring in translators to work with, with the people who need translation help, but it's a shared translator system. In other words, if they're busy, you may not get a translator when you need one. It's possible, if it's possible, bring a Japanese speaking person on your staff. Uh, always is, uh, is your first choice. You can hire your own translators, a bit expensive but it does make it a lot easier to communicate with the buyers. Okay. And the third thing is prepare your presentation in terms of what's your story. Okay. Japanese buyers love a good story about your product. They want your product to be, they don't want you off the rack, here it is, uh, it's pretty, please buy it. That's, that doesn't sell your product. That doesn't sell your product. There has to be a reason why it's good. There has to be a reason why it's unique. And the visual is not enough. You have to be able to explain that. Um, and it's hard. It's it's not. I, I'm saying this. I'm saying this as kind of a, a matter of fact. But you develop your own style to do it. Because um, Cheryl's presentation is different from Jimmy's presentation. Is you know is is, is different from every everybody else. Um, when when they when when uh, when uh, Lala Woodworks does, does their co-op pens, his presentation is very very interesting. And I'll see why because he's one of the few guys able to display a lot of product in a small area. Okay. But how he explains <laughs> all the different pieces, I'll never know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just incredible. It's incredible. I don't know. I don't know how he remembers how all these pieces are. Like. <laughs> Aaron, how do you? Can I add to that? Yeah. Okay, so um, you know the whole thing about the Japanese business cards and stuff like that. You know, there's a lot of you guys that actually brand yourself as a Hawaiian story. You know. Uh, some of your uh, some jewelry people are transcend, you know, just being made in Hawaii. But for me, because I just use Koa and things like that, I use the Hawaii brand. So I don't necessarily have to have a Hawaii business card. Um, you know, that's not necessarily my target market. That's part of our story. All of us is that we're from Hawaii. So the Japanese appreciate that. Uh, the other thing too is what Neil was saying, how people sell things differently in Japan. I mean, some people are sellers, some people aren't. It's the same way that you word things in your in your literature. So um, a Google translation will definitely hurt you more than just an English uh, literature. Um, as far as planning, I've been doing this. I've been doing trade shows for 15 years, so I've kind of got that down. but. One thing I would suggest to everybody is um, order your Wi-Fi before you get there <laughs> if you're arriving at 10 at night. <clears throat> so get your Wi-Fi sent to your hotel mm -hmm. so you're not lost without it. Because a lot of the airports, the Wi-Fi, um, the mobile hotspots, I think they close down at 10, the sales parts. I think Narita is different, um, but um, Haneda, it's harder to get your Wi-Fi if you come in late. Thanks, Aaron. So. Good point. Cheryl, how, how uh, do you prepare to uh, uh, participate in the trade show? Um, we've been doing a lot of trade shows, too, for Tori Richard, um, you know, all over Hawaii and the mainland as well. And um, a lot of those practices we use in Japan, too. Um, one thing I do is, well, because I'm not a first-timer and I've been doing this for a few years, uh, I do contact all of my 
customers or potential customers, I keep every single business card and I actually write on them what they came to see me for. Did they want men's products? Are they women's products? Are they a hotel? Are they a boutique? Are they looking for uniforms? Are they looking to buy wholesale from us? You know, I make notes on my business cards and I keep everything. And uh, every year before the show, I email each and every one of them and let them know that I'm going to be in Japan again for TIGS. Um, and tell them that I'm going to be there. Uh, I'd like to make an appointment with you. And I set appointments with them. So I'm not sitting at the show wondering if I'm going to have a customer coming. I've already built that customer base at that point. Um, so the customers, that regular customers that do buy from me will always make an appointment. And then I also reach out to the new potential customers to uh, let them know, hey, I'm back again. Please come by and see our new line. So uh, that, that's been proven very useful for me to get uh, customers. Thank you. Jimmy? Um, to prepare for the show, um, I diet for about a week and then just <laughs> pig out when I'm there. My goodness. For anybody who's never been to Japan and this is your first time, the food is just unbelievable. And uh, I'm just kidding. But uh, as far as, uh, no, I'm really, it's, it's unbelievable food and it's the same quality of the products. But um, as far as preparation for our booth, um, you know, we, we're, we, we take risks at, at my company. We, we try different things. Um, you know, we, um, we kind of we look at what, what's worked, what's resonated, what people um, still talk about. And, um, you know, for this, for this upcoming show, um, you know, one, we make sure that, um, that we have, um, you know, our distributor, our a point of distribution lined up, that we have, um, you know, products that we know we're going to push and that we will that will be available to the customers because um you know we've actually presented before and it's like oh well how, how do we get it and i'm like i don't i don't know can you help me find a way and and generally that's not a uh a good way to start sales um but um you know at this show our focus is now on the on the branding because we've got we've got some volume of product going out and um we're, we're doing, like Satomi said, private label, basically. We're, a lot of our volume is for restaurants. So people are learning about the sauce, and they're using the sauce. Now they just need to know what sauce it is that they're using. And um, we're actually um, planning a, a new campaign where we have a story about how the sauce was made in Hawaii. And um, we have these characters developed um, from... Uh, we call them the Kilauea Fire Cousins. It's basically a bottle of sauce with eyeballs and a goofy wig. And, uh, and, and we're going to try and engage the customers and test out on these 200,000 people whether or not this campaign is going to resonate and do we invest more in that. So that's kind of our, um, you know, our, our, our goal for this show. Um, it's kind of interesting that you said like this cartoon character. Yeah. You know, yeah. we've been thinking about something like that, too, so it's interesting that you would say it, you know, because they like cute stuff. But anyway, um, the way we prepare, um, we, well, for, for me, I have to contact my distributors, uh, let them know I'm coming, um, please bring your customers. We set up appointments, first of all, with our distributors. Um, because as far as customers, it's their customers and they, you know, they'll invite them so that they can taste our product and they like to meet the maker. So that's why my husband and I are there. Um, so what we focus on um, is what are we going to you know, have as tastings and it's how do you create something new and so that's, that's our biggest thing and um, Luckily, we have a distributor, so I can say, you know, I, we can ask them, hey, you know what, can you bring the cooler because I don't want to lug it from Hawaii and stuff like that. So it's just um, contacting them. Also, because we have more than one distributor, and this is something that I learned, and I know Neil talked about it, and, you know, the mentality of this, um, the, um, you know, as being American, they operate very differently, so I have to be really sensitive when I have a distributor who's next to me, but then I have another distributor who's walking by. I mean, I don't have 10, I only have like three, but I have to be really sensitive to that. Um, there's this thing about master distributorship that we don't really, at this point, we don't really um, 
not believe in, but we don't adhere to that, you know, so um, uh, that's one thing that we, we just make sure that we be sensitive to that. But basically, it's just um, contacting our distributors. What do you need? Do you need any point of sale material so that we can have it printed, new banners, um, and what to present at the show? Thank you, Satomi. So, you know, the Made in Hawaii product is unique, but as the panelists mentioned, it's the provenance, the story behind the product that makes it even more unique. So you have to know your product and what makes it special that you can express to the customer. And if you don't have a true story, at least think of a story that you can attach <laughs> to the product. I mean, you guys are all salespeople. I mean, be culturally sensitive, though. That's, that's but, uh, you know, come up with something that you can use as a sales point. Now, most of you or most of our exhibitors have already participated in trade shows, or we expect you to have participated in trade shows either on the mainland or in Hawaii. If not, we would advise you not to go into the Japan market as yet until you develop your local or your domestic export market. So what we're talking about, we assume that you are already somewhat seasoned trade show people uh, and that there is some basic standards of etiquette at trade shows. You know, I've been told that uh, when I work trade shows, you know, don't go button hook people and start yelling across the aisles, hey, sample, you know, things like that. <laughs> okay. You have to be discreet because other <laughs> vendors are there that, uh, you know, they're going to complain and say, hey, you know, I mean, he's stealing my customers or you try to divert their attention. In Japan, it's even a little more unique because it's a different culture. So with that, I wanted to ask our panelists, What's the differences that you have found in the uh, Japan trade show customer versus the Hawaii and the domestic trade show people so that uh, uh, we're able to not offend them, but befriend them? <laughs> Neil? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, basically, the show's in Tokyo. Okay, and I, I, I'll, I'll qualify this. Tokyo, the Tokyo culture is different from the Osaka culture, it's different from the Fukuoka. They're very different. They're very different in their day-to-day -day mannerisms. And Tokyo's very, very what you call majime. They're very, very straight-laced. They're professionally polite. I like to say they're professionally polite. They can smile at you and be so engaging, and they're thinking, like, oh, you're an idiot, but you would never know. Okay, so, I mean, but they're very polite people. Um, the, the buyers in Japan who come to the show come in different types, there's different types. There's, there's large chain store buyers, there's uh, small chain store buyers, there's uh, boutique buyers, and they're all a little bit different, and you can tell by the way they dress, okay? The smaller shops will tend to be much more casual. The larger the shop, the more formal. Some guys are coming in their suits, you know, they're working for a big suit company. Um, but the presentation in and of itself is friendly. Japanese people like Hawaii culture, like Hawaii people. They drop their guards with us a lot quicker than they would trying to talk to Americans or other mm -hmm. foreigners. Uh, they, you can get them down to the grass level just by being yourself. Okay? So it's not so much a matter of being Japanese as being yourself and being polite. Okay? Um, with, with, with that being said, um, to the, the buyers in Japan are very, in Tokyo especially, will always I, I can politely take an interest in your product, okay? But they'll never say yes. Yes is not a word in their vocabulary. If a company, I, I've learned, when a company comes to you, yes, I want to buy this right now, I take a step back and going like, why? You know, mm -hmm. you're not normal, okay? Uh, there's different kinds of buyers out there. There's some people you do not want to sell them to, even if they want your product. And you've got to be able to kind of qualify this a bit. We, 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 we will help you with some of that. Um, but. You, you have to be yourself, okay? Um, we are not refined, we're culturally refined enough to fake people out. We, <laughs> Hawaiians, <laughs> local people are just very, we, we live close to the skin and people know when we're natural and they know when we're not natural. Even we know when we're not natural. The Japanese are much more sensitive to that. Okay, be yourself. They like us, okay? They like us, okay? Um, 
So th that's 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 what I can say about that. But you do have to be respective of their of their culture. Um, good to know the basics, how to present a business card. Um, not all Japanese like to shake hands. You know, you can do the little small little waist bow kind of thing when, when you give your card and things like that. Um, and it's just a nice way to break the ice before you take it down to that one-on-one -on -one conversation kind of level. But one thing I'll tell you about the Japanese buyers that you have to be prepared for is that they all have a Hawaii story because almost all of them have been to Hawaii before. You will spend a lot of time talking about Waikiki Beach and Diamond Head a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and it's how interested you can stay when you're saying the same story for the 300th time <laughs> is a test of your salesmanship. Okay, really, you know, <laughs> you, it's, I, I've seen guys lose it on the, on the third day of the show and they've been on the floor all day long and they're, they're, their shoulders are drooping and they're looking all ragged and it's 300th time I'm telling my story about Waikiki Beach and you can just see it in their faces and the buyer can see it in their faces like, I'm talking to you but I'm not really interested. You gotta learn how to th throw up the sales face and stay professional. Okay. Um, it's a discipline thing. It's a discipline thing. Okay. But it's discipline on our level. Okay, you just you just imagine working for the hotels in the Wa in Waikiki and just dealing with tourists all day. It's kind of like that in reverse. Okay. Now what Dennis was saying too about <laughs> going on the going on the Oz and grabbing people. Yeah, that's that's a no no. But in Japan, especially with the food guys, there is a way to scream across the entire floor to draw people to your group and not offend anybody. Okay, um, you're gonna see that. You're going to see that because we have a section where our Hawaii cafe and our Hawaii cafe boys are Japanese, and they're not, they'll do it. They'll be yelling, and they'll be yelling all the way across, you know. Um, but what that does is it draws people within earshot to our section, okay? If they get too loud, you just kind of let me know, and I'll tell them, shut up a little bit, you know, it's, that's my job. Okay? But that's all part of the culture. The Hawaii section, you will feel it when you get to the floor. The feeling of our area is different from the rest of the floor from any other international section, from the domestic section, we have a nice vibe in our area. It's very, people just let their hair down in our area. It's really interesting to see it's because it's us, okay? So maintaining, maintaining that type of energy is half the, half the step to, to just getting that first contact and that, that first that introduction going. Yeah. Of course, having all your materials prepared once you've got them in is where your individual salesmanship comes in. Your turn. My turn. <laughs> wow, you basically went over everything. Um, for me, I think uh, the cultural difference is in Japan, a lot of the buyers, it's all about the relationship. It's not just selling. Um, here, you know, you can just work with someone. They like your product, they'll buy it. Um, in Japan, it's the relationship. Uh, really, the more they get to know you and your product, the more they're going to buy, the more they're going to want to buy. Um, so I do try to maintain relationships, especially with our regular buyers. Um, try to get to know the new buyers as well. Um, sometimes even in the evenings, I'll go out to dinner with them. And you know that's how you get business going, actually, is taking them out to dinner and talking about you know, work while drinking. Um, I'll bring omiyage to my customers. You know, um, I'll sit there, and every time they come, I'll be like, "Thank you for being our customer. Um, thank you for always, you know, working with me." And as a gesture, I'll give them something as a thank you. Um, and I think that's something very different from what I would do here because you don't pass out omiyage. You know, you don't you don't do the whole going out with them, drinking with them to try to get business. So I think that's a that's something different, definitely that uh, I do when I'm in Japan. Thank you. Jimmy? Um, you know, it, yeah, pretty much everything they said is um, kind of, kind of relates to, um, to what uh, my experience has been. Um, you know, our, our very first show that we did, you know, we got like, you know, 50 leads and I'm like, wow, this is fantastic. And I'm like, wow, you know, Neil, check out this. And he's like, oh, oh cool, man. And then, and then, and then um, you know, six months later, I'm like, Neil, uh, no, no, nobody's uh, buying anything. He's like, yeah, they're just being polite, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but you know, the next year I went, and then my distributor called over, um, you know, hey, Jimmy San, do you remember? Do you remember Abe San? You know, he's with um, so and so restaurant chain, and uh, you know, first thing you know, he he remembered meeting me, and first thing he does is say, where's my poke from Alicia's Market? You know, I'm like, whoa, how do, how do you know about Alicia's Market? You know, that's, uh, that's crazy. So, and, and he just wanted to talk story. You know, then third year, they 
took me out to dinner next time I was in town. Um, really, really good dinner. And uh, next thing you know, three months later, I get it, I got an order. You know, we got we sold 40 cases that summer. Um, you know, and here we are today, and uh, we just got in an order for uh, over over 500 gallons of sauce for just a small restaurant chain, and that's a small restaurant chain. So over time, you know, that relationship and that whole talking about Alicia's Market yeah. and playing beach volleyball, because that's what we do here every day, you know, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's what, um, it's what, it's what helped, help my company grow, and, uh, you know, and hopefully we'll, we'll, sust we've um, fabricated a relationship that will sustain and continue growing and building on that, so. Um. You know, like we're in food, and um, so what you'll notice when you go to Japan is there's really no rubbish cans wherever you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, another note, you know, if you're going to serve food samples, please bring your own rubbish can and your own trash, you know, liners, because that's really important. So on that same note, when I do a sampling, you'll notice um, that when you have them sampled, they'll give you the cup back because they want you to throw it away. So if you're not familiar with that, you might get offended. Like I was like, hey, throw your own cup away, my rubbish can's <laughs> right here. But that's not how they operate. So that's one thing. Um, but other than that, <coughs> you know, um, diddle everything that they said. Um, the Japanese are polite. They'll only take a sample if they really want to try. Other than that, they won't because I, I don't know if they feel indebted to do something with you or give you a card or something. And of course, you know, as business people, we're going to we're gonna ask them for a card. You know, um, we have samples. Some of them, they want to take samples. So, and that's just a handful. Um, we had a really unusual incident recently, and um, a competitor of mine, well, they sell tea here and they sell tea in Japan. Um, my distributor didn't know what kind of company they were obviously, you know, he's just not familiar with that, with the tea uh, per se. But she came to ask me for samples, and I was just standing there, and then he gave it to her. So, you know, um, you have Japanese business people that are like that. They're coming to kind of check you out, and they'll have a gall to take your samples and so forth. Um, so, you know, that I thought was pretty unique. It, it doesn't happen often, but just just notice. Thank you, Satomi. Uh, I think we lost Aaron unless he's with us by audio. Yeah, he lost. He, his uh, computer was dying, apparently. Oh, he's okay. traveling in Colorado. Oh, okay. Hmm. Okay, can, right. can I take a one, one, one step back? Sure. I know yes. a lot of you guys, um, we're talking with guys with distributors in Japan. I'm seeing kind of faces with the new companies who don't have distributors. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I, the show is there to find an importer and a distributor at your primary, but it's not your only customer. You can make individual sales to individual stores and those kind of things. It's just a matter of how you want to structure your market. When you sign up for the show, if you have questions about those kind of things, you ask me. Okay? And I can give you the general layout of what, what the general patterns are. Okay. So I know some guys are going like, oh, but I don't have a distributor to help me with this. If I do this show, I'm on my own. Uh, yeah, we were all on our own the first time we went out there. But we worked together as a group. That's why you go with the Hawaii guys. The Hawaii group is really, really good. I mean, they could be your competitor here, and you could throw rocks at each other. But you help each other when you're in Japan. It's really, it's really nice. Okay. It's my job to be sure everybody behaves. That's, I'm the policeman. <laughs> yeah, I'm the policeman. That's my job. And I, 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 I can be really mean, too, so they know that. I can just be a real rat. You know, I'm putting you next to the rubbish cans with all the ugly people. <laughs> I don't like you. Really. <laughs> One thing good about participating with the pavilion as the Hawaii pavilion, as opposed to participating at a trade show with your, your own standalone booth, the thing is, besides we have, um, we have Hawaiian music piped in, so it creates the ambiance. There's the, the visual, there's the audio, but it's also the aloha spirit that is amongst your fellow vendors. You know, we're very lucky. Instead of saying "ida shai maste" or you know, you know, come and see my sample or can I help you, all we have to say is "aloha," and then they'll feel that oh, it is the Hawaii Pavilion. So we have something going that 
others don't have. And if all we learn to say is to everyone who passes by Aloha, you know, they'll feel like, wow, this is some special place. You know, we're bringing part of the islands to Tokyo. So that's one of the things in, a, you know, working the booth is to use the word smile and say aloha as much as you can to people passing by. And they'll appreciate it and they'll, uh, you know, they'll feel warm towards you. So you've prepared for the trade show. You've got your price list, you know, your product that you want to market there. You develop your storyline, your sales pitch and everything. You're operating your booth professionally. Uh, you know, you're friendly with your neighbor. Uh, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then you've got leads, you know, people are saying, oh, I'm interested in your product. You know, let's, uh, what do you do to take it the step further? Panelists, what do you do to take the step further with the lead? I will follow up with them as soon as I come back from Ho uh, Japan. Uh, I'll shoot out an email um, knowing that a lot of them are being just polite and saying that they're interested. I'll actually send out emails to all of them. And the ones that do reply, I know, are the ones that are seriously interested. And they're the ones that I will pursue um, after the show. And if they don't uh, send an email back, I'll just keep their card and just make a note of that and see if they come back to the show the following year. And, Good. Yeah. Thank you. Um, for, for me, I have a distributor that I, that I trust, um, an importer. Um, he's basically the master distributor. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll follow up with the distributor and let him kind of take it from there. And if there's something I'm not too clear on, I'll ask Neil. <laughs> <laughs> um, for us, um, we make a, a copy of all the cards that have stopped off at our booth. And then I give all the cards to my distributor, and I review the uh, the cards, and I get together with my Japan marketing person, and then I call my distributor, and I say, hey, have you followed up on this person, this person, this person? I expect some kind of report maybe about a week or two weeks later, and if not, then I email back to them. So that's how I follow up. Yeah. Well, real quick, uh, half a step back. Um, you've got your price list, you kind of know what your products are going to sell, that's your wholesale price in Hawaii, okay? But you have to understand the cost of freight and how it affects the buyer. I've seen so many sales fall apart because I, oh, this is my price in Honolulu, and when you add on the freight, they're going like, oh my God, that's really expensive. So you have to study how you get your logistics, how you get your product there. If it's just from airport to airport, uh, that's good enough. Um, from Hawaii, you have two options to commercially ship freight. One is by full 20 foot or 40 foot ocean container. They don't do consolidations out of Hawaii or by air. Okay. If you're going FedEx, US, USPS, DHX or whatever, um, I don't consider that a commercial sale. I consider that a point to point kind of almost like a mail order sale because the, the, the cost of the delivery is horrendous. Six boxes of my chocolate, if I put it in an in a international flat rate box, it's $65. That's more than that's way more than the product in the in the package, and that will turn off a buyer. Understand that when you're presenting the product, that the buyer is looking at this actual approximate cost. Okay, so you, you don't give him sticker shock. There's a lot of times you'll get to the wall, and you'll you'll do a lot of work, and then they find out what the freight is, and then they'll just they'll just abandon you. They'll just back off on you. So you've got to be aware of that. Um, the the second thing you've got to be sure is you under uh, when you make this when you. Um, when you're, when you're following up on the sale and you're, you're taking care of the sale, the business card. The business card is your golden ticket. That's your e-ticket. Okay. If you exchange a business card, uh, that, that buyer is in play. Whether he was polite or not, you've got his card. That gives you the right to contact him and bug the hell out of the guy for an answer. Okay, Because you've exchanged cards. It's, a, it's been a formal introduction. You do not do that. If, you, if people come and talk to you but they don't give you a card, you do not follow up on those. Okay, that's, that's technically a transgression. You're, you're being very impolite, you're being pushy. Okay? They give you a card, you exchange cards, follow up, follow up, follow up. Um, and then you start to sort, never throw away a Japanese business card. Keep them in a pile of guys who didn't respond, but, but keep them. And just kind of thumb through them and okay. get familiar. Because you'd be surprised when these guys will boomerang back on you one, two, three, mm -hmm. four years later. Mm -hmm. okay? And they'll remember you, mm -hmm. and you've got to have some point of reference not to look yes. like an idiot. And it happens to me all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know guys that I met like 15 years ago who just came out, hey, and we're like, hey, and we're like, who the hell are you? And, but I, I actually have 
four suitcases full of business cards. I mean, four suitcases of all the years in Japan. I've got four suitcases full of business cards, and I actually, believe it or not, because <clears throat> my wife is really good at this, she's actually had them categorized. You know, so I could actually pull up, oh yeah, this guy was doing this, and this guy's to, to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, but it's, you, 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 you've, got to, you've got to get that kind of mentality going. I don't expect yeah. you to be as, as totally idiotic about it as I am, yeah. but you've got to get that mindset, okay? You've got to get that mindset. What the price is going to be to the customer, when, when you get the sales order, how are you going to handle the sales order, what your lead times are going to be for delivery, um, and more, very, very importantly, and I was telling you before, is you've got to qualify the buyer. Qualify the buyer. Qualify the buyer. We've had people in past shows find good clients who bought stuff, and we find out they're basically operating out of a studio apartment mm -hmm. out in the suburbs of Nagoya someplace, and he's just interneting this stuff out, yeah. and he's trying to get a commercial sale off of you, and they're doing it illegally. Can, can I jump in on yeah. that as well? Okay. Um, I have a similar story. Um, please, for those of you going to Japan for the first time, please, please, please don't think that everyone is, um, they're good people because they're from Japan. You got really slimy ones out there too, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, and a lot of people don't think that because they think, oh, Japanese, you know, they're so prim and proper and polite and there's no bad people out there. Well, there are. Um, I'm not saying that everybody is, but just keep in mind that there are people like that. So please be careful. Um, I had a, a president of a, com a company call me on my cell one day and I had his business card. So I had met him at the show. I had met him maybe two or three times. He, he's come by. And um, he asked me for a favor. His favor was, he says, I have fabric and I have labels from uh, another company and I'd like for you to manufacture it with that labeling on there. Well, it was our competitor, local competitor. And I said, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. But for some reason, they thought we would. And so, you know, um, and they're trying to be sneaky because they didn't want to go through our competitor or something had happened and, and they couldn't go through that competitor anymore and they had their labels so they had asked us to uh, produce their shirts or dresses or whatever it was for them since they knew that we're also another apparel company. Um, so, you know, I had to just tell them, no, I'm sorry, we can't do that. We only produce our own merchandise. And then I had to go call that local competitor, tell them, hey, by the way, um, I just got a strange call from Japan. Uh, this customer called asking if we could do this. And so, you know, just know that there are slimy people out there, too. And you really need to be careful. And don't think that because it's Japan, um, there's no one like that out there. You know? yeah. That is very true. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and... It's understanding who the buyer is, but not just because they might, you know, be ill and have ill intentions. But um, sometimes it's just understanding how, where they actually are in the company. Um, you know, you know, because <laughs> hey, uh, a, a senior vice president of this and that sounds pretty important. But these companies are so gigantic. You know, um, it's part of like an unpaid intern, and and we had we had an, in, an instance where um, we we. We met a buyer at a at a show, and uh, we had a discussion about, hey, you know, this sauce would be great. It's great on local mocos. Hey, they see Hawaii local moco as Hawaii food, so we thought, all right, well, let's get this sauce into your stores. And she introduced us to her supervisors and bosses, and um, you know, so the the discussion came to getting them the prototypes and getting the bottles into the stores. So instead of just making the prototypes. I got a little overzealous and printed up 5,000, you know, labels and this and that and, you know, because we were going to be sending tens of thousands anyways and come, come, you know, six months later, we find out that, yeah, that buyer just wasn't that high, high, high up enough to make those key decisions. So when, when it came down to making that decision on, hey, are we going to carry this local moco sauce, um, it, it got... It got axed. So if anybody needs local moco sauce labels, you know, <laughs> I got some real cheap on the cheap. I'm gonna be, but um, but that was that was just my experience and not understanding who that buyer was and where they were in the decision making chain. Um, yeah, yeah. That's important to know who who the decision decision makers are, and I think that's in even here in Hawaii and in America. I mean, that's really important to know. Um, Kind of off this subject to help you folks, you know about the um, the hotspot and uh, phone. I have a website that you go to. It's called Rent a Phone, and you can order a hotspot and a phone, and it'll be waiting for you at your hotel. 
good rates. I, I go through Global Advanced Communications. That's also another company as well for mobile um, Wi-Fi. So you can check out both and see what you think. But they do deliveries to the hotel or pick up at the airport. So, yeah. Good. All good suggestions. <clears throat> You know, the, uh, I guess before we open it up to question and answers, I, I wanted to uh, reiterate some of the must-dos uh, that you uh, uh, need to uh, prepare yourselves for. Like Neil mentioned, must-do is to have your business cards, preferably, well, should be in Japanese also, English and Japanese. Another thing is, must-do is your price list with the freight included. One other important must-do, which sort of relates to what Cheryl mentioned, it's uh, you have a brand name. You must register it in Japan. Otherwise, someone coming to the show will see your company's name, and they'll say, wow, what a neat name, what a neat product. They'll register the name and make a similar product. You also would like to get licensees, licen licensors, no, licensees for your product. You can't license your product unless you register your product, uh, your name. So in registering your name is very important before you even go into the market. I have heard some scare story of one large prominent uh, apparel manufacturer and someone did rip off their brand name, and uh, they were forced to decide to work with them as an agent. So please register your name. Uh, any other must-dos, uh, Neil, Cheryl, Jimmy, Satomi? That well, you get into that product, uh, that product registration. Um, yes, very, very important. You would be, there are people who make a living of, of registering other people's. It's a thing. It's, it's more yeah. prevalent now um, in Asia. It's not just Japan. Um, and in J Japan, Asian interpretation of, of trademark registration is different from Western countries. First man to register owns it. Doesn't matter if you're the most famous brand in, in the US, if you didn't register your brand and somebody else does, you don't own it. There's a very, very, very famous retail chain here in Waikiki who can't use their brand name in Japan because some guy who lives out in the sticks, I think he's a farmer, registered the name. Okay. Um, it costs about $2,000, more or less. Now, it's also the Japanese trademark registration is very tricky. You may register by category. And within a the category, there's subcategories. And everyone has a different cost. It's like, um, I have the name Menuhuni Mac. I originally could not register the name Menuhuni Mac because Mac knives were in Japan, the cutting knives uh, out of Europe. So, they wouldn't, so I had to make Menuhuni Mac one word. Okay? It's not Menuhuni and Mac, it's Menuhuni, and we got around it. But I, can, I only registered for the food category. Well, somebody who registered the name Menuhuni for clothing, somebody who registered Menuhuni for, for accessory items, um, and I can't produce little trinkets or whatever with the Menuhuni because I don't own the brand name. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've been lucky enough to meet these guys, and we kind of all agree that we're not going to step on each other's toes, but it's, it's <coughs> very, very uh, something you've got to be cognizant of. Okay? Um, it is an expensive registration process, it's, uh, and it, I believe it's for three years. You've got to renew it every three years. Um, a lot of you guys are going, well, should I register before I go? This is a call you make. It's expensive. Now, I feel that the very first year you go out to the show, you should have it. But if you don't, you're still okay to a certain point because your brand is just being exposed. If you feel like you've got something going, you can register. The registration process is a lot easier now than it used to be. Um, you can actually, if you find somebody in Japan who has know-how, they can do it online. Before you have to hire an attorney and do all that kind of stuff, it, it, you don't have to do that anymore. Um, and we, as, as part of the TIGS program, if you come to those issues, uh, we, we can help you with that. We, we can help you with that. I won't pay for you, but you know, we, we can help you with that. It's not as complicated as you think, but it's something you really, really got to consider. That's what I mean, you've got to commit to the market. you got to commit. That's part of the commitment. I'm registering my brand. I'm registering my brand. Yeah, that's part of the commitment. Um, Japan is not a, like, like Dennis was saying, it's not like the first show you ever want to do is a Japan show. You've got to have a little bit of experience to get out there so you understand what's going on. Really important. Panelists, anything else to add that uh, 
really you should do. Um, get get to get to know you know, and it was, this was brought up earlier. Get to know the other vendors. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. You know, use that opportunity. Um, you're going to trade war stories. You're going to yeah. trade you know, and and you're going to learn. You're going to learn. You're going to learn. Um, again, learn from prior mistakes, um, and maybe even get some inspiring ideas on how to better position your products. Um, and uh, and attend attend the dinner. Uh, there's a there's a dinner. I don't know if there's space left, um, but there uh, after the first day of the show, there's a a wonderful all you can eat, all you can drink dinner that um, we all go to. And um, and and make sure you know the words to Hawaii Aloha. Or are you gonna? When yeah. Dennis starts up, then uh, yeah. otherwise you're gonna be like me, humming along. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, I, I don't. I don't pass out lyrics. So you need to, yeah, yeah, yeah. No song yeah. sheets. So, no, it gets this is an all you can different. drink event. So I mean, one year we had everyone had to sing their high school alma maters. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The whole guy started it. Wearing yeah. <laughs> they died out with white hair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, um, go ahead. Yeah. Um, this is this is this is the the Hawaii the, the Tokyo International Gift Show for the Hawaii guys. It's just not a trade show. Okay. It's it's actually an event that it's multifaceted. Um, I don't know of anybody who's ever come to the show walked away disappointed. Even if they didn't make any sales, they didn't walk away from the show disappointed. The networking alone with the other guys was worth its weight because you'll never meet these guys here. You're never going to get all these people in one place from all these diverse categories, talking story. Um, like Cheryl's example, when you find some rat company who's trying to horn in on somebody oh, else's I business, <laughs> your network <laughs> your is, will, will keep an eye out for you. We found, we found what we call pirate importers illegally importing Hawaii products. Mm -hmm. At the show, showing the products, they forged all the import documents, and we know they did, but they're there at the show. Well, other members saw the product. Mm -hmm. Hey, we saw that product over here, and they're not supposed to be here. So now we got a lead. I would never have seen it myself. These guys happen to see it. They report it to us. We take action. Mm -hmm. okay. um, so you, building a network is really important. Mm -hmm. And we got a really good bunch of guys. We got a really good bunch of guys. My evil plan for anybody attending Tokyo Gift Show is I got to be sure you have fun. Okay? <laughs> and the reason why is this. You, you're going all the way to Japan. And if you're not having fun, you're going to be very discouraged to put a lot of energy back into the market. If you enjoyed yourself, even if the sales were kind of flat, you're motivated to go to back to Japan again, and you're gonna find reasons to do it. You're gonna be motivated. Um, it's a really evil plan. It, it basically a lot of food and drink, a lot of drink, <laughs> <laughs> and rolling you rolling you back. Oh, one one real quick thing too. No high fashion statements if you do the show. Don't want to see girls in high heels. Don't want to don't want to see the, the you know you're gonna kill yourselves. Okay, um, dress appropriately. This is not a fashion show. I've seen girls not be able to stand up the third day because they were fashioning out. Uh, you know, no, 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 no. It's, it's not like that. We recommend everybody wear aloha wear. Yeah. You know, because it's uh, the Hawaii booth. So, yeah, it's yeah. I need to reiterate. It's important to get to know your fellow exhibitors, because a lot of times you do get business too from your fellow yeah. exhibitors. You know, I've known bag manufacturers who got business from the apparel manufacturers, and uh, you know, so it's uh, likewise. There's a lot of doing business amongst and with each other, as well as support and the networking that they can put you in contact with someone too, that, you know, it's, uh, it's you know, I think it's, there's this camaraderie among the, uh, the Hawaii folk to help each other. So that's another thing about this trade show that, you know, everyone realizes we are a small community and uh, a community of uh, like-minded people. So uh, everyone pretty much uh, tries to help each other out. So uh, we'd like to open the floor up to any uh, questions that you might have, some of the areas that we may not have covered. Uh, anything, you know, you're free to ask us, and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, the right answers for you. So anyone uh, want to start off with the first question? Oh, come on, you guys. No shame. <laughs> I know you got questions because we didn't cover a lot of stuff. Okay? And no question is too small because, trust me, there's, there's stuff that you should know that we didn't cover, and I know that you want to ask. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for all of uh, you that have distributors, do you uh, utilize your Japanese distributors in Japan at the show to be your interpreters or... 
supports that? Yes. Yeah. It's it's case by yep. case. Some guys do, some guys don't. It just depends on the situation. Like 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 Cheryl basically is a one man army. She speaks perfect Japanese, and I, I think her agents will probably just get in her way because she's like she's like totally turned on when she's at the show. <laughs> uh, Jimmy uses his agent exclusively. Um, I'm one of the few companies who have multiple importers, but in totally different categories. Um, and as a rule, kind of because I'm I'm the contractor, I'm actually not allowed to get a booth. It's a conflict of interest. But I do have my distributors who put up some product, but we don't make a big splash of these things. Um, it's a it's a it's a call you make depending on how supportive you think your distributor or importer will be. Some importers won't support you. They won't. And then you got a question: You're not such a good importer, are you? Um, but that's how you tell people, you know. And sometimes the quality of your importer they may be great going out to the street and selling product one on one. They may be terrible at trade shows. They may not have the personality for trade show. Um, so the manufacturer makes the call. You own the booth. You can ask who you to work with or not to work with. But your distributor's biggest help is that they've got product in Japan, or they can import product for you in Japan. You don't have to throw it in your suitcase and lug it over and try and try and get it in a taxi or a train to the show site. They've got cars. They've got transportation. It really makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Y yes, Okay. Okay. Not just that, but beauty too. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so the the question was um, how to prepare for the export, um, basically, um, uh, from from a from an import customs kind of perspective. Okay, there's definite categories in Japan. Japan cut there's when you have food and cosmetic, uh, food and cosmetic items, you will be basically under the Japan Ministry of Health Regulations and Japan Customs. If you have dry goods, you will be under Japan Customs. Um, but sometimes it'll it'll reach over. The Japanese are considered the masters in the world of what's called the non-tariff barrier. Okay, so we have duties and tariffs that we all deal with, and these are international agreements. But the Japanese will take it a further step. Well. They'll find safe, uh, health and safety issues with certain types of additives or ingredients or, or uh, consumer concerns that, that's codified in their laws that are not, part, not, not covered by duty and tariffs. I'll give you an example. Uh, food items, when you take them into Japan, you must present your entire food ingredient statement broken up by percentages, which is giving away your recipe. Okay. Um, <laughs> but if you don't do it, you don't get into the country. You have to outline exactly how you made the product, step by step by step by step, as a required document. Once that's done, you've got to send Japan custom samples, and they will lab test it in Japan to verify your product. Um, the, Japan, the Japanese have a thing called the control list. It's a list of agricultural and food chemicals that are not allowed in the country. Things that we take for granted here are illegal in Japan. Um, sodium benzoate, part of margarine, illegal in Japan to a certain degree. Uh, so you can put small amounts of it. Um, there's, there's a lot of chemicals, food colorings, uh, food additives that we use here that are FDA approved. They're totally legal in Japan. And these are the kind of things you have to work through. Um, I, I, I actually help a lot of companies with this. Um, cosmetics, it's even a little more strict for cosmetics. Anything with a skin application or topical application, you're considered a pharmaceutical. You're considered a drug. So the importer in Japan has to have a pharmaceutical import license to handle your product. A lot of the Hawaii soap guys have a lot, a lot of uh, customers who want their product, but they can't find a company with a pharmaceutical import license who wants to import Hawaiian soap. They have a really hard time with that. Uh, we're, I'm actually trying to address that in a kind of a side thing, um, but you've got to go through the same process of showing them what your chemical, what the ingredients are. For fashion, um, I found out recently, because I don't deal with fashion, but they want to know what the material is on for your labels, what kind of, sometimes you want to ask what kind of inks you're using uh, for paper goods, dry goods. So there's all these different pre-qualifications to be sure your product can be imported. Okay. Uh, the dry goods are not as strict. Uh, for the food items, for the cosmetic items, if you do the Tokyo gift show, I will find, I will get to you very, very early on, as one, once I know what category you're in, and I will work with you. 99% of the time, I can get your product cleared for Japan import. You have to pay the costs. Um, 
but there's sometimes when your recipes or your ingredients are just plain illegal. And you gotta make the call if you wanna alter your recipes to be compliant. But I try to catch you really early, early on. So there's, a, there's this hope to do that. I don't want anybody wasting their time or wasting their money. The worst thing to do in Japan is present the product, the buyer wants it, and the buyer finds out you're illegal. I mean, aside from being shamed, okay, that puts a bad view on the entire Hawaii pavilion because like, oh, they're just throwing stuff at us. You know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna be known as the guys who are throwing out swap meat stuff. You know, mm -hmm. we got qualified products going in. Mm -hmm. If you come to the Hawaii, the, the Hawaii um, pavilion, all the products are importable. That's a, that's a goal. Sometimes there's some things that are kind of on the on the edge, and that's okay. But they can't be flagrantly illegal to import. Okay, yeah. So there's a process to this. When you find an importer, your importer in Japan will have to go through all these steps to get your products legally cleared. Okay? And it's they should know. So when they talk to you, if they're talking seriously about importing, one of the questions you ask them is, what's your import experience? What other imported lines are you working with? Uh, that's a good question to ask any potential importer for your products. Uh, what are you doing now? Who are you? Um, so, so, so there's all of that. So, this is like I said. This is not for the the first time crafter who just wants to go to Japan to do a trade show. You've got to have a little bit of experience. You've got to know your product. Uh, and I, I, I do. I work one on one with every company that signs up. In, in that sense, I can pretty much tell. You're going to make it, and you've got issues that we got to look at. And it's my job to sort it out. You know, thank could, you. could you also share on some uh, practical advice for um, bringing in the um, samples for the show? Like, I mean, this eight <laughs> cases of sauce is omiyage through customs, you know? <laughs> okay, now, my the, friends really uh, like the uh, sauce. The trade show is a little different. The, 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 the Tokyo gift show is not an over-the-counter sales show. It's a, it's a B2B show. You, you're, you're going to buy it. You're concerned about materials for display. You're considering about samples if you're giving them out. But you're not bringing in truckloads of product to try and sell it over the counter. That's not what this show is about, okay? So 90% of our guys, if not more, <coughs> will actually just bring their products in with their suitcases, okay? Yeah. It's only for display purposes. The food guys have to be, you have to be warned that you have to have your product cleared by a, by a licensed Japan a food importer to get what's called an import sticker on every product you bring in or you can't even sample the product at the show. You're not allowed to serve it to the public. We have a mechanism that gets you through that. It's a little tougher for the, for the cosmetic soap and, and, other, and other people. Okay. Um, so you've, you've um, hand carrying it in is fine it's because you know how your displays are going to be set up. If you've got high value items like jewelry, I've got an art company coming in, they got thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars worth of value of stuff coming in. Um, you, if you try to bring it in your suitcase going to Japan, they may not catch you, but if the U.S. Customs catches you bringing it back, they're going to nail you, okay? Because there's no proof that you didn't have it made in China and you're trying to smuggle it back into the country. You've got to go to U.S. Customs, you've got to call them, you've got to register yeah. those expensive products to know that you can get them in and out. There, there's, there's international documentation um, that will be accepted on, in Japan side as well that you're taking it for a trade show for prison's purposes and you're bringing it back out intact. Um, call U.S. Customs to get that. Um, yeah. I forget what it's called. It started with a C. Carif or uh, I forget what it's called. Yeah. I, I do chocolates. I don't have to worry about that. I can just toss my stuff. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, and, and there's all of that. The other thing you have to be very, very, um, and uh, we, we can turn off all the microphones if you want to do this, but this is what I've, I've told a lot of people. Sometimes your, your products are very bulky and you're bringing in several boxes and they're for the trade show. Japan Customs does not take kindly to the fact that you're bringing something in for commercial purposes. Even if it's only for displays, they might try to hit you with a duty. Uh, I tell them, hey, it's omiyagi for my friends. You know, <laughs> and I'll take it. You just gotta be reasonable about it. I, I got one guy who just kind of lost it. He had like nine big boxes of stuff for the show, and he's telling me, that's omiyagi for my friends, and they look at him going like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> so he was at the airport for three and a half hours. You know, they, they, they just tore him up. So um, yeah, be practical. Um, when you do the gift show again, before you come down, I check with everyone, I be sure what they're bringing up. And, and I actually do check with every company and every person one-on-one -on -one many, many times during the process. Just so, especially for the new companies. So you just kind of got, I want you to be very comfortable going in. Okay? You don't need the hassle of worrying. Okay? You just don't need the hassle of worrying. Yeah. Thank you, Neil. I'll give you guys some chance to think of some questions, but in, oh, okay, yes, sir.
service uh, at a time before the trade show, and if there were, for example, three tea companies, would that be a problem? Or that this. Yeah, the, the, the show is, the show is uh, come one, come all. If I've got nine companies doing, doing the same product, I got nine, I, I've got nine fashion companies. I think we've got about eight or nine fashion companies in this year's show. The idea is that we're going to try and not, you know, we're not going to try to group them together where they're just kind of just getting into each other's way. We try to space them out um, to a point of practicality. Um, I do send out a list. We just sent out a list a little while ago of the list of companies mm -hmm. who are participating. Um, and um, I'm going to be sending out another list on where your booth placements are going to be, and you can see where everyone is situated within the pavilion. Um, but that's as far as we'll go. We, we, I had to stop taking a lot of these requests for companies to be here, there, and everywhere within the pavilion because when you're dealing with 60, 70, 80 companies, and I've got to move one, I've got to move 50 other companies to accommodate the guy. Um, and that just got really impractical. Uh, so, but we try to be very, very cognizant. Uh, when you guys register for the show, we ask you what type of product you have, and when we try to place you in there, we try to be sure that you're well spaced enough, mm -hmm. apart from each other, not to be not to be crossing over into each other. And there's some companies who are actually competitive, want to be next to each other. I get requests for, can I be next to this guy? Can I be next to that guy? Um, and for them, it's synergistic. Mm -hmm. They actually find out they draw everybody in one area. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of my big Japan uh, importers says that the more e most effective way to sell products in Japan is not by co individual company, it's by category. Mm -hmm. You put all the clothes in one section, you put all the soaps in one section. And he says buyers like that because they can just go down the line and see everything in one small mm -hmm. section. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a theory I'm observing right now. I want to see if it's really true or not. But the guy's a lot of experience, so I'm, I'm, I kind of understand where he's coming from. But I don't think we do it for the to for, for the for the Hawaii Pavilion. What, I think we'd always uh, respect it, respect the breakup unless you made request to be next to each other. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we don't <clears throat> we don't limit uh, the uh, types of uh, businesses by their category. It is, as Neil said, it's yeah, open to all. Uh, we uh, are a state agency, and uh, we uh, cannot discriminate except on the basis of. It has to be a made in Hawaii product, 50% made in Hawaii. And uh, as uh, Neil had mentioned, uh, we do have several companies, coffee companies for instance, there's several of them, chocolate companies, there's several of them, apparel companies, there's several of them, water companies, you know, they may be competitors, but to a lot of times they feel that by in fact co-locating, there's a bigger presence that they might be able to. Once they talk business, though, it's uh, you know it's very discreet. So, uh, while uh, uh, any other questions? Yes. yes. Yeah, just out of curiosity, how many booths last year in the pavilion, and out of the booths, how many are Oh, <laughs> okay. The pavilion got enlarged again this year. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. How many booths? How how many booths were there at, at last year's event? Um, the pavilion uh, um, got expanded this year. I'm trying to recall off the top of my head. <clears throat> it's not so much the number of boots because we actually we actually partitioned the boots into full boots and half boots. Um, and there's also companies, uh, brokers who will bring in multiple companies to stay in one booth. Last year, I believe we had 72 companies, or I forget how many. We had 70 some odd companies last year. Uh, we've got just as many this year. Um, but yeah, we do have uh, half boots, but sometimes the half boots turn into quarter boots because mm -hmm. we have two companies maybe working out of a half boot. We try not to scrunch them in too much. Half boot is the, the, the minimum that we would like to you know, have a company represented in. No, yeah, with that being said, so a booth is three meters by three meters. So about nine feet by nine feet, that's a full booth. A half booth is slightly smaller than that because you gotta have a little walkway in between uh, you know, so you call it about 1.5 meters, supposedly, but it's more like one meter. Uh, we've got groups coming in, like the Maui Food Technology Center, who will take a bulk area um, for multiple Maui companies who are small and just want to do the show, and they're sharing resources. So they'll take two full booths and throw seven companies into it, you know, kind of thing. So the, the configurations are very flexible. The configurations are very flexible, yeah. Uh, someone online asks if you could repeat the Wi-Fi hotspot recommendations. Oh. Oh. Rent a phone. 
we'll rent the Actually, and uh, what we'll do is we'll <clears throat> do it in our newsletter. The bulletins, uh, yeah. The bulletins that we send to our vendors, and we'll give that information in writing. <coughs> that way uh, they'll have it readily the, available. The only one thing I would, I would tell that person is do not use, the, do not rent the Wi-Fi provided by the show site. Oh, no. yeah. It's terrible. And if you and lose signal, expensive. you won't get your money back. And it's written in Japanese, so unless you can read Japanese, you wouldn't know what paper you just signed. <laughs> and it's really expensive. And it's really expensive. Yeah, it's expensive. Okay, I'll give you some additional time to think of questions, but uh, in order to add more value to our presence at the Tokyo International Gift Show, we have uh, did a project called Buy Hawaii, Give Aloha. And uh, I wanted to call Lyle Fujikawa of our staff to talk about this uh, Buy Hawaii, Give Aloha added benefit. Oh, yes, Brenda? Yeah. Uh, Chuck, there may be online questions too because of the online audience. Yeah. Yeah, Blake is yeah, checking. I just asked. He did ask the question. So this is Lao Fujikawa. He'll go over the uh, Bai Hawaii sure. Aloha. Sure. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> so, Lao So these are samples of labels and tags that we're producing. <coughs> Hi, so Dennis uh, came up with this idea that if we had a branding platform, we could really capture the, the emotional brand value of, of the Hawaii products. And this is something that we're doing for our trade promotion, uh, our export promotion at trade shows. The market is really uh, for buyers uh, abroad, like at trade shows, um, but there's, of, of course, also local. So we're going to start with the uh, Japan market first. You can go to the next slide. Uh, the problem is, while Hawaii does have huge uh, emotional brand value, of course, we get copied a lot, right? So we are losing um, opportunities to sell lower quality products, will dilute the brand, and it takes away revenue from uh, the actual people who are making uh, products. So as a solution, what we, the DBED, uh, Dennis decided was we create this idea, buy Hawaii, give aloha, and in order to help companies to associate themselves, we are creating these stickers that you can actually put on products, we're gonna have signs, uh, we're creating a website that's gonna be a clearinghouse uh, for your uh, online presence, and we're going to do this. Uh, I'm actually leaving on Friday for the Hankyu show. I think a few of them, a few of you folks are going. It's a B2C show. The idea is to get uh, people to, while they know that uh, Hawaii has great uh, brand value, they may not know what is actually being made in Hawaii and what's not. Um, it's a little tricky because there are some products that are being sold that are made in Hawaii. And so our idea is to have those stickers affixed to uh, the actual products. People will look for that and they'll say, okay, well, they'll trust that. That is actually authentic and, and made. Um, not only is the brand value higher, but it, it gives you a chance to have a little bit higher pr uh, pricing where you can get you know, more income as well as a profit margin. So objective is to you really create more metrics. I mean, how many companies are actually doing it? Qualitatively, uh, you know, what is the increased awareness of you know, is this really authentically made in Hawaii? And this is really help you with your sales. Uh, the very first metric is really just how many people are gonna be participating, um, what we have on the website that uh, we'll be launching. And is, besides the page views, we wanna put your website there. If you have online e-commerce, if we actually send you a link and you actually have a sale, if you can record that, we'd love to hear your report on that. As I mentioned, uh, you know, target audiences, uh, if it was here locally, would be visitors, so people actually buying uh, abroad. We are also going to be testing this first in Japan. Um, as I mentioned, Hankyu is the, the first market. 
we have a, another show uh, called the Hawaii Expo at the Hikarie uh, site in Tokyo, uh, where we'll be doing, that's also a B2C. Uh, so the Tokyo International Gift Show, I think all the companies that are uh, participating will be able to use this and we'll have uh, the banners and uh, labeling there. Um, trade should also be understanding that, yes, if I actually source authentically made Hawaii products, this, this will be good for me as well. You know, it's going to be definitely in demand. Uh, you have a higher pricing point, as I mentioned. And I think in, in, ben, in general, uh, just consumers are looking for that, you know, what is really made authentically in Hawaii. Next. Um, just really in general, talking about the brand values, Aloha. Um, actually, go to the next slide. So. You know, why should we buy Hawaii? So shopping locally will support Hawaii small businesses, uh, helps our economy. But the idea of uh, gift giving, I think you all know, in Japan is very important. That the omiyage, uh, the fall, the, the winter, as well as the summertime, gift giving is a very um, ingrained uh, custom. And so this idea of if I buy something from Hawaii, I'm thinking of you, uh, this is a really important gift. Um, you can also buy it for yourself, right? You know, you buy yourself gifts and you think, whatever, um, I'm freezing in, in wintertime, I'm drinking my uh, tea chest tea and I'm warming up as I listen to Hawaiian music, I brought back to my uh, Hawaii experience. Um, you can go to the next. Uh, so ideas uh, at Hankyu will have a, a very small booth, they have uh, these large banners. Uh, there's a talk show uh, where uh, the MC is actually really talking about the program, uh, getting consumers to uh, seek out. Uh, at the booth, we'll have small signs, and if possible, we'll have this, the stickers and the labels on the products. It actually goes to, if you can go to the next slide, a website. Uh, we have this in English and in Japanese that describes the program, what is the meaning, um, the next slide. And it actually goes down to registered companies. And this is where you would have people if you're seeking out the company um, or just looking in general what is made in Hawaii, uh, that would be something that we could keep on there. So the idea is that we're going to give you a, a more extended presence than just the one week at Hankyu or the few, few days at uh, Tokyo International Gift Show. Hopefully this will give you a longer uh, presence online. Okay, And we'll have a process to sign up online if you uh, are interested later on. But in general, these are going to be done mostly through our trade shows. And we'll see how the, the demand goes if we expand it further. So, thank you. So, yeah, basically it's stickers and hang tags that we want you to affix to. First of all, our director had a good idea. Affix to yourself. Buy Hawaii, give aloha. Sort of like a badge for our pavilion members. But also to your products. Because there's a lot of Hawaii-like products or products made in the Philippines or, or Thailand or whatever that are made to look like Hawaii products. With this Buy Hawaii Give Aloha uh, tag, it'll be sort of authenticating, authenticating the product is made in Hawaii. So hopefully we'll distinguish our real products from the, uh, the imposter type products. And as Lyle mentioned, We'll develop a website so that once they go to the uh, web address there, they'll also be able to find your company listed and they can go to your website also. So it's, uh, it's sort of a seal of approval for one thing. We'll make it available in hang tags for garments, stickers for products, uh, and also for um, uh, follow up on the website. So that's what uh, we'll introduce at the uh, Tokyo International Gift Show. Yes, sir. And there's no charge for this. We'll make the uh, stickers and the hang tags available. So, like the Department of Ag, I believe. Yeah, the they do have a policy. seal of approval. Most, yes. Is that, it's it's is competition for that? No, it's not. We're using this only for particular trade shows and retail stores. It's not for, uh, it's not for broader. Yeah, it's not for Hawaii at this point. Yes, Satomi. Yes. yes. Same note with what that gentleman just said. You know, Department of Ag has their own seal of quality. Right. Um, what's to prevent another 
someone sleazy guy in Japan to make some kind of a seal like that. And the only reason why I say that is I've had an incident where, you know, you've got all kinds of seals. We use USDA organic and all this that kind of seal. There's this one store that we had at, um, you have a lot of Japanese vendors here in Hawaii, small. What this Japanese vendor did, and they sell to the similar small stores that, we, that our distributor sells to, they made their own seal mm. of quality that said, basically Hawaii and if it didn't have the seal mm -hmm. it wasn't and they put their stuff all in one section mm -hmm. so that would be my only concern I think it's a great idea I know what you guys are trying to do but how would we yeah well the policing for instance that seal of quality that the Department of Ag has they have the uh, legislative right by statute they're supposed to maintain that quality that it is a made in Hawaii product and, and sort of police it. Uh, I don't think they have the resources to do so, but they have the resources to authenticate. But other than that, yeah, it's, uh, as you say, these sleazy uh, people will do whatever they can to sort of make their official uh, whatever to add some sort of official imprimatur on it. Ours is just within the show to sort of show that it's distinguished as a made in Hawaii product. And hopefully then, you know, if they won't go to the other booth that has, uh, you know, coconut bras that they're selling, that are, they're trying to, <laughs> that they got elsewhere, we got the real coconut bras, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the real coconuts. <laughs> so, can you mention, I mean, can you give us some information on the... On the... There's yeah, you know, the you know, with this, the seal of quality, um, there was another vendor, I guess, a lot, I, I don't know that person per se, but he or she decided to make their own seal and put it on her products and products that she distributes. And then it was placed in one section. So a Japanese tourist coming in would look at that and go, oh, this must be the real thing. Yeah, so let's look at it and then... And, and I know a lot of, uh, I've seen in the past others, they use the royal coat of arms. It's like the official seal of the state of Hawaii and they use that as official things. And there's a lot of different ways that people do this. And unfortunately, uh, yeah, um, there are people like that, that they do that. Are there any other questions? We got five more minutes before we let you go. Yes, Matt. So I have a question. Um, every year you want to bring something exciting and new to your booth. So would there be any objections or is there anything wrong with trying to do maybe a giveaway to get business cards? Is that something that's allowable or is that something that's kind of common? The, the question is whether you can do giveaways to start um, giveaways and things from your booths at the show to generate more activity. Um, Japan is really weird. I think for the trade show, it's not as, as strictly enforced. But in Japan, uh, free giveaways are actually taxable. And you're taxable to 100% of the gift. That's why in Japan, you never see win a free trip to Hawaii. Because the tax on it is actually the full cost of the trip to Hawaii. Oh, okay. And the reason why they do that is because larger companies have a huge advantage over smaller companies if they start buying customers. Um, so that's one thing. But having an, an interesting activity or something, um, you can ask Jimmy. Jimmy's the master of that. Jimmy actually does, Jimmy's booth is going to be actually uh, a promotional booth as opposed to a sales booth. He wants to, he wants to promote the branding. So they're going to have like a game and they're going to be giving away you know, small prizes. And that's, that's totally all right. Um, and I, the reason why you get away with it is because it's a skill. There's, there's a skill involved. It isn't a, it isn't a lucky number drawing or, or a lottery or anything like that. So I think you've got to be a little creative. But there's, there's no reason why you can't do it. I think my, my biggest concern would be is that if it's a really, really good game and it's a really, really good prize, you're going to have too many people standing in front of your booth, blocking out everybody else under the sun, just crowding into because the Japanese like free stuff just as much as everybody else. Yeah. Now, now would it be wrong to to make like a serving? Like say for my product? What, no. what kind of flavor would yeah, you it, like it, to see and then we'll give you something for 
I, I learned this the hard way. In, in Japan, when you take surveys, you're almost obligated to give a gift if you're doing a public survey. You're obligated to compensate the person for the time to take. I mean, it's, it's not like going on the street and just asking people questions and say thank you very much. That's, that's, people do it, but it's very tacky. It's very tacky. So you've, it's like you actually have to invite them, get their permission. Um, you, most guys will use a professional survey taker to pose the questions correctly. Um, and I, I say that with a grain of salt because I know a lot of times they pose the questions to get positive results on their survey. Um, and, it, and they give them a, a compensation. And the compensations are usually much more than what you would expect. Yeah. But that's a good idea. Maybe we can come up with some sort of promotion. Maybe like a gift bag of Aloha, have all of the vendors toss in one sample, make a big giveaway bag, and maybe have people put in their business cards. And I don't know how we decide on the winner, though, at the end of the show to pull the name. Think that might be possible, Neil? That Let kind me of go thing? check it out. Um, I, I got to probably clear it with the show organizers, uh -huh. basically. Uh, it's going to be a little bit public, but we can always go check it out. Because it's a closed venue and a buyer's only venue, it's not an open to the public event. We have a, there's a lot more leeway yeah. in trying to do it out on the street. So I'll go check on that. Yeah. I'll go check on Good that. idea. Anything else? Well, oh yes, sir. Just a quick question. So at, at this show, do you also have other um, buyers from other countries? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, have you had success uh, moving forward and, and having contacts with these other yeah, so the question is, are there other foreign buyers who come to the show? The answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, have people made sales? Yes. Some have been very, very interesting. Uh, slow to develop sales for sure. It's not like I met the guy and I'm making a sale on site, but you develop the relationships that led to sales. Um, I can honestly tell you over the years, <clears throat> several hundred thousand dollars worth of Hawaii product has gone to a third, third country out of, from context media to show. And you'd be surprised, sometimes you meet European buyers. Uh, sometimes you meet American buyers. Mm -hmm. uh, I know a Hawaii company started selling products in Mexico because he met a buyer at the Tokyo Gift Show. It was, it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like, um, you know, we've, we've had guys like even from uh, Korea and uh, whatnot, um, but the problem is I don't have logistics set up. I don't have a distributor in Korea. I don't have, you know, so, so there are logistical issues that and also my resources as a company in Hawaii, I'm also limited on resources as to how much, how many markets I can concentrate on at a time. So, um, you know, it is something that we talk to our distributor in Japan about because um, one of the things is taking advantage of like a foreign trade zone like this. If we're sending him product there already and he can hold it and then from there he can ship to Korea, Hong Kong, whatever, a lot cheaper than us shipping direct. So down the line, um, you know, I do see us executing on some of those leads generated internationally, but just because of the size of my company, I'm not able to do that at this time. So. Thank you. Lewis, you wanna give us some closing remarks? Just uh, end this on a high note. Are you uncomfortable when I'm I'll interpret for you. <laughs> uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, what I gotta say is that it, uh, it can be very intimidating. It is a very big event. I mean, I don't think uh, we touched upon. I mean, the Hawaii Pavilion is in between the Pavilion of Korea, Malaysia, China. There is no United States Pavilion, by the way. <laughs> we are in competition with countries, and that's how how much. Uh, brand recognition for what he as a state has. And so this is an opportunity for each and every one of you to uh, ride along with that, with that brand. And I wish everybody here luck. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. And if you have any other questions, you can email us, anybody at DBED, uh, Neil, and uh, yeah, more than happy to uh, help you out. And if uh, you're not if you're thinking about it, uh, I hope this has been very helpful to you. If you will be joining us in September, we look forward to seeing you. So take care, drive safely. Oh. Oh. Oh.